Hello everyone, Cal Unit Productions back at it again with another episode of America's Obscure Steam Locomotives, the series where I talk about the lesser known classes of steam locomotives once used in North America. It's been a while since we covered this series, so I got another one ready here, and with a handful of more classes to talk about. Nonetheless, let's get straight into them, shall we? For our first stop, we're heading all the way down to the lobster state of Maine with the Maine Central Hudsons. The roster for the Maine Central was primarily made up of 060s, 280s, 460s, and 462s, all serving the railroad's different jobs. But the passenger trains were primarily handled by the 10-wheelers and Pacifics. Around the 1920s, passenger traffic was increasing, and the Maine Central would start looking for a larger passenger engine. This would see the construction of two 464s classified as the D-Class. Both 701 and 702 were built by the Baldwin Locomotive Works in 1930, and were the only super-powered locomotives built for the main central. With a boiler pressure of 240 psi, a tractive effort of 12,000 kg, a firebox area of 306 square feet, and drivers with a 13 feet wheelbase, these were nicknamed Pocket Hudsons by the railroad and were the smallest Hudsons built in North America. To be honest, the existence of these Hudsons has been questioned by many rail fans, and it could be for a few factors. Some of these factors could include the economic conditions of the railroad, traffic levels increasing, or the concern of running a large locomotive on the main central. Because of their placement on a lighter railroad, they were only restricted to operating between Portland and Bangor, to which the rate restrictions were more relaxed to allow Hudsons to run properly. However, once dieselization began after the war, the Hudsons would be retired with 701 going in 1950. However, 702 would last another five years on the nearby Portland Terminal, only being used during the winter season for melting snow in the rail yards. 702 would finally be retired in 1955. A quiet end for the lightest Hudsons in America. Moving straight to the pigtails, we have the Pennsylvania Railroad L1 Mikados. The Pennsylvania Railroad is known for a lot of things. The Horseshoe Curve, the Juniata Shops, or the iconic locomotives like the K4 and T1s. However, its freight locomotives are also diverse. From the overpopulated H6 consolidations to the busty and powerful I1s, the non pensy but still successful J1s, or the efficient and reliable M1s. But the Pensy's own Mikados are usually thrown under the rug. The L1s were introduced in 1914 by the railroad's own Juniata shops, but also the Baldwin Locomotive Works and the Lima Locomotive Works building some of these Mikados as well. In total, 574 Mikados were built, the class being randomly nicknamed Lollipops. If anyone knows the reason why they were nicknamed this, please let me know in the comments. The class would be responsible for handling the road's many freight trains, and over the years, would see many modifications, including the removal of piston and valve tail rods, the addition of mechanical stokers, booster engines on the tender, experimented with the Pennsylvania's unique train phone system, and interestingly, one L1 was specifically fitted with the experimental Emerson water tube firebox which was the same one used on the Baltimore and Ohio's Lord and Lady Baltimore, respectively. However, as much as the L1s proved to be efficient, the class would slowly succumb to various factors, which included increasing train lengths, the arrival of the more powerful I-1 decapods and M1 mountains, and the cherry on top, the stock market crash of 1929, which would result in various members of the class to be put in the storage by the early 1930s. However, their careers were not over yet. As once America went to World War II, the L1s returned to service to aid in the wartime effort. Also around the 1940s, a few L1s would be sold off to other railroads which include Forts of the Lehigh in New England, two to the Cambria in Indiana, three to the Santa Fe, two to the Interstate, and two to the DTNI. By 1948 though, retirements at the Mikados would begin as the Pennsylvania began its decade-long dieselization process with the last members of the class being retired in 1957. Although some sources state that a few were active as late as 1959. Thankfully, L1 number 520 is preserved at the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania in the iconic land of Strasburg, where it sits on stack display alongside other Penzi steam locomotives. While good performers and living a decent career, they managed to continue on despite being displaced by more powerful engines. 
Heading over to the Midwest, we have the Wabash P-Class Hudsons. <sighs> the Wabash Railroad, the undervalued fallen flag of the Midwest. Their Hudsons were rather obscure, but underrated as well. And also, these weren't built as factory fresh Hudsons. Instead, these seven engines were originally built in 1925 as K-5 Mikados, and they originally spent their time handling freight trains, so... Nothing too out of the ordinary looking at them. Aside from the three cylinders the Mikados were equipped with, so that's something, I guess. Fast forward to 1940, with World War II already putting the railroads onto a massive overdrive with traffic, the Wabash needed modern passenger locomotives to handle some of their iconic trains. And given with wartime restrictions not allowing new designs, the Wabash seek to rebuild the 7K5 Mikados into 464 Hudsons. Reclassified as P1s, the Hudsons would have larger drivers, the iconic Timken roller bearings, and streamlined casing, as well as the iconic elephant ears. And honestly, it made the Hudsons look more flashy compared to other locomotives on the Wabash. And honestly, I can understand why people like them. They definitely do look classy for their type. The P1s would eventually be assigned to the road's fast passenger trains, such as the iconic Cannonball and managing to prove their worth even after the war years. However, their time of fame wouldn't last so long, as by the 1950s, the Wabash would begin dieselization, and by 1956, all the Hudsons were gone. While for gone for some time, they've been getting a cult following in recent years, and I could understand why. Definitely the more underrated, flashy engine of this list. Making our journey down to the Overlands, we got the Union Pacific Overlands. A bit of a unique wheel arrangement for the series, this time being a 4102. This wheel arrangement was really utilized by the Southern Pacific, however, the neighboring Union Pacific would develop their own class merely a year later. In fact, the first Overlands were arriving around the same time the Southern Pacific was getting theirs. Coincidence? I think not! In total, Ten of these were built by Alco, and were assigned to freight service on the Overland route. When it came to naming the class, they obviously couldn't call them Southern Pacifics, and the name Union Pacifics was already occupied by the 12-wheelers, so... It was decided to name them Overlands, after the Overland route, to which they primarily operated on. While looking powerful for 10-wheelers, the Overlands weren't as successful as the wheelbase was viewed to be too rigid to work anywhere outside of the Overland route, and the three-cylinder layout was rather unusual, with Walshort's valve gear on the outside and Grizzly's conjugated valve gear on the inside, this only proved to make the Overlands mechanically complicated. This would result in the class being rebuilt in 1942, to have two cylinders instead of three, making them partially better. Even with the upgrades, retirements of the class would begin in 1948, with the fleet getting smaller until the remaining three would be retired in 1954. While the Overlands had a bumpy career, the Southern Pacifics would endure for a few more years compared to the Overlands, with one of them being preserved today. Despite their problematic career, they still managed to work regardless of their complications, and, and at least UP tried to fix them to an extent. Before returning to the Northeast, we got some mixed traffic engines from the west again, with the Southern Pacific MTs. It can't be a steam locomotive related series without some Southern Pacific, right? Well, amongst the fleet of daylights and cab forwards, they are the more contemporary engines, with their fleet of mountains being one of those. The first mountains were built by Alco in 1923, with the last ones arriving in 1930, totaling 77 mountains across five subclasses. The mountains ended up being the backbone for the regular passenger and freight operations for the SP, usually racking up to 12,000 miles every month. They managed to have a good amount of features to be capable of working wherever, which include special cast steel components, a narrow cab, feed water heaters, booster trucks, and many of them being fitted to burn oil. Some members also were refitted to have Skyline casing, similar to the larger GS Northerns. Hell, some even getting repainted to look like the daylights, like 4352 for an example. With their success, they managed to last through the war years and into the final days of steam, with the last ones being sold off by 1959. 
Heading to the gracious land of anthracite coal, we have the Redding K1s. Given that the Redding's main traffic was handling coal, you would need a fleet of strong independent locomotives to handle these trains. And this is where these chonky beasts came in. The first K1s entered in service in 1927, as the first 11 members were rebuilt from the larger N1 Malloys which were built a decade earlier. The final 10 K1SBs were later built in 1931 by the Baldwin Locomotive Works. These beasts were rather big compared to other Reading locomotives of the time. With 61.5 diameter drivers, a sick boiler with 225 psi, and a tractive effort of 92,521 pounds, they were rather powerful and chunky. I swear, the Reading had a thing for thick freight locomotives. One interesting case for one of these Santa Fe's was number 3010, which was classified as a K1SC due to it being built with Caprati valve gear. This only proved to be a problem regarding maintenance and eventually was rebuilt in 1942. Around this time, the K1s were receiving some slight changes to make them more modern, from new disc driving wheels, new drifting valves, and tapered main rods, all resulting in an increase in their top speed, from 50 miles an hour to 60 miles an hour. These changes would make the locomotives look more modern and coinciding with more recent locomotives like the T1 Northerns, which, coincidentally, the T1s were rebuilt in 280s. Huh. By 1948, the Reading would begin dieselization, and the K1s would be reassigned to the coal regions as well as the Shamokin division. The Santa Fe's continued in service until retirements began in May of 1954, with the final members being withdrawn by the spring of 1955. Finally, we're ending our journey in the graceful commuter area of New Jersey with the CNJ's 10-wheeled camelbacks. In my personal opinion, these fleet of 10-wheelers are the best commuter engines in the northeastern United States. Yeah, I'm probably gonna get canceled for that, aren't I? The first 10-wheelers would arrive in 1902, and many more classes would be built until as late as 1918. In total, 111 10-wheelers were built across 10 different classes. The more iconic classes would what I'd be calling the late camelbacks, to which would fall underneath the L5 to L8 classes, which also had a few subclasses as well. These late camelbacks had larger boilers, bigger fireboxes and cylinders, and the addition of superheaters, making them a lot more powerful and large compared to the early camelbacks. Given that freight was already assigned to the Mikados and other locomotives, the 10-wheelers were widely adapted on the road's commuter and suburban services alongside the existing suburban tanks, but they would also do occasional freight service from time to time. Crews took a liking to them as they performed efficiently for the jobs they were assigned. However, despite their reliability, camelback designs were slowly falling out of favor of American railroads due to their impracticality, and retirements would begin in 1934 but many of the late camelbacks would stay on boards with the railroad into the war years. By 1950, the fleet was reduced down to 51 camelbacks, as the fleet was slowly being downsized with the arrival of the diesels. Finally, on September 25, 1955, L7AS No. 774 hauled the last steam-powered trains on the CNJ and was originally planned to be donated to preservation once retired. But this fell through, due to the CNJ saying they already did enough for preservation, after donating the only surviving Camelback Atlantic and Box Cab 1000 to the BNO Railroad Museum. Another factor was CNJ offering 774 to Don Wood for $5,000, to which Don couldn't raise the money in time, and this fell through. As a result, no 10-wheeler Camelback survived the Cutter's Torch. While the only CNJ camelback we have today is Atlantic 592, the 10 wheelers were the better representation for the CNJ's camelback fleet, as they proved to be more capable of doing the work assigned, and they were well received by crews and the engine staff, and they're recognized more compared to the Atlantic. I mean, the 10 wheelers did get represented in model form a lot of the time, and what about the Atlantic? You know what they got? Nothing! Absolutely not! It's because of all these reasons, these camelbacks will always be remembered as one of America's obscure steam locomotives.